Okay, this lecture is going to be over the work and energy. Many of you have heard of energy and kinetic energy. You know the difference between kinetic and potential energy. That uh, kinetic is the energy of motion and potential is the potential to of motion. So we're going to look at those in detail and then also look at conservation of energy. So kinetic energy um, is force. Well, we know that work, the net work, is force times the change in x. And if force equals ma, we can say ma is equal to the change in x. x meaning the distance traveled. And we know this equation, vf squared equals vi squared plus 2a times delta x. So we can then put in a delta x. We're going to substitute. So for this a delta x, we're going to substitute, rearrange this equation. And we'd have m times vf squared minus vi squared over 2. That's where that equation comes from. Or we can say the net is equal to 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mvi squared. So we have 1 half mvf squared minus 1 half mvi squared. So looking at kinetic energy, we are just looking at the one half is equal to, or kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So the SI units for kinetic energy, we saw that right here that work is equal to one half mvf squared minus mvi squared. So they are actually the same units as work. Kilogram kilograms times meter squared over second squared or a newton times a meter. We can also say if we had, if we look back at this slide, let's see right here, network is equal to, this is really final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. Whenever we have final minus initial, that is a change so we can say the net work is equal to a, the change in kinetic energy. This is called the work kinetic energy theorem. So the kinetic energy is the work an object can do if the speed changes. And W net is positive if the speed increases, if the speed decreases, then W net, the net work is going to be negative. So a six kilogram cat runs after a mouse at 10 meters per second. What's the cat's kinetic energy? Take one half times the mass times velocity squared. You should get 300 joules. Suppose the above cat accelerated to a speed of 12 meters per second while chasing the mouse. How much work was done on the cat to produce this change in speed? So remember the net work is equal to the change in kinetic en energy. So we can find our final kinetic energy taking one half times the mass times the velocity squared minus, we know our initial energy, and you would get 132 joules. Okay, potential energy is the potential to move. A lot of times we use objects sitting up on a shelf they have the potential to fall to the ground. That would be potential energy. Um, the book held above the desk, an arrow ready to be released from the bow, and then some other types. We have gravitational. That would be falling to the ground also. Um, elastic. So if you pull a rubber band, it has elastic potential energy. And then also electromagnetic potential energy. Gravitational potential energy. PE, they use a little subscript C G to make it gravitational potential energy, is equal to MGH, the mass, times the acceleration due to gravity, times the height. So the SI units, mass is kilograms times acceleration meters per second squared times a height. Again, we're going to have a kilogram times meters second kilogram times meter squared over second squared or a newton times meter which is all equal to a joule.
So the height always depends on where the zero level is. You can have it to the floor or maybe to the desk, depends on what you decide if you're dropping a book or some other object. So elastic potential energy is the energy available to use in deformed elastic objects like rubber bands, the springs on trampolines, pole vault poles, muscles. Um, for springs, the distance compressed or stretched is delta x. So it says here if you had the normal spring and it's relaxed, you're just letting it sit there on its own, this is the length of the spring. But if you push that spring in and compress it, this is the compressed length. So from this distance right here, from where it's compressed to the relaxed distance, that would be your delta x. Let's see this video. The spring constant determines how much force a spring will exert for a given compression or expansion. For example, if we attach one kilogram weights to each of these springs, we see that they stretch different amounts. The larger the spring constant, the stiffer the spring, and the more force that is required to stretch it. The spring constant depends on the type and amount of material a spring is made of, and how the spring is formed. Okay, so you can see you all have have um, used springs and can know, know that there's different stiffnesses in springs. We will study at the end of the very end of the year, we're going to study springs and a lot more and periodic motion in general. Um, but this is a type of potential energy. And so elastic potential energy, PE elastic, is equal to one half kx squared, where it's one half k is our spring constant, and then the distance compressed or stretch squared. So the spring constant depends on the stiffness of the spring. Um, stiffer springs have higher K values. The spring constant is measured in a Newton over a meter. Not Newton times a meter, so it's not a joule. It's Newton divided by a meter. And that's the force in Newtons needed to stretch a spring one meter. So the SI units for P elastic, what would they be? Well, if this is Newton divided by a meter, and a kilogram, a kilogram times meters per second squared is a newton divided by meter, so really it's a kilogram over second squared. And then we're multiplying it by a distance squared, so we would have a kilogram over a second squared times a meter squared. So we'd have a kilogram times meter squared over second squared, or a newton times meter, or a joule. So here is your practice problem. When a 2 kilogram mass is attached to a vertical spring, the spring is stretched 10 centimeters, so that the mass is 50 centimeters above the table. So the distance stretched is 40 centimeters. You'd want to convert that to meters. Um, you take 1 half times k. Oh, gravitational potential energy. That is mgh. So you have mass times... 50 would be, you'd want to use 50 as your distance to the table. You should get 9.81 joules. And the elastic energy, if the spring constant is 400, so you'd have 1 half times 400 times your change in spring stretch would be 40. You would get 2.00 joules. So now what do you think? We already, you should know what the potential and kinetic energy difference is, but hopefully that helps you know how to calculate those. Okay, and then we're going to look at the conservation of energy. So imagine two students standing side by side at the top of a water slide. One steps off the platform falling directly into the water below. The other student goes down the slide. Assuming the slide is frictionless, which student strikes the water with greater speed? And think about... What do you think the answer would be there? So as we go through, we'll come back to this question. And then what is meant when scientists say a quantity is conserved? And think about different quantities that are conserved. Are they always conserved? 
So mechanical energy is adding up all the kinetic energy, all the poten gravitational potential energy, and any elastic potential energy. It does not include the many other types of energy like thermal energy, chemical potential energy like stored in bonds, and others. So mechanical energy is not a new form of energy, it's just the sum of all the kinetic and the potential energy. So suppose a one kilogram book is dropped from a height of two meters. Assume no air resistance. So calculate the kinetic energy and potential energy the instant the book is released. So right when it's released, is there any kinetic energy? Would that answer would be no because it's all it's not moving quite yet. And so it's all potential energy. So it'd be um, MGH, so mass times gravity times the height. When the book has fallen one meter, then you're going to want to find, okay, you have some kinetic energy. You're going to have to find the velocity at that point. That's where you'll need an equation from chapter two. You're going to need to find if the initial velocity was zero, final velocity after one meter, and then add that to the potential energy is no longer two meters. It is now only a meter. You'll add them together, and they end up being equal at that point. And then right as it reaches the floor, there should be no more potential energy. All of that energy has been transferred into kinetic energy. So potential energy is zero. Kinetic energy is 19.6 joules. So here it's showing at each height, we can see how the potential energy and kinetic energy just interchange. In, but the mechanical energy stays the same. So that's where we get the conservation idea, where the initial mechanical energy and the final mechanical energy do not change. They are always equal to each other. So the sum of kinetic and potential energy remains constant. They can change from one to another, but you do not lose or gain any energy. The mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic energy and all the forms of potential energy associated with an object or group of objects. In the absence of friction and any other external forces, the total mechanical energy remains the same. This principle is called the conservation of mechanical energy. Consider a pendulum of a clock swinging in the absence of all forms of friction. At each position of the pendulum, its mechanical energy is the sum of its potential and kinetic energies. At its highest point, all its mechanical energy is in the form of potential energy. As the pendulum swings, some of the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. At its lowest point, all its potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. As it reaches its highest point again, all its kinetic energy is converted into potential energy. It does not matter what position you choose, the sum of potential and kinetic energies is a constant value. The mechanical energy is conserved. And again, when we study the springs, we'll study more in depth about pendulums, but you can see that mechanical energy is conserved. Um, acceleration does not need to be constant. Um, and there has to be no additional forces acting on it. So Mechanical energy is not conserved if friction is present because you're adding an external force to that. If friction is negligible, conservation of mechanical energy is reasonably accurate. So a pendulum, as it swings back and forth a few times, after a few, after several times, then the friction um, will take into account and it will kind of lose the swing. Um, consider a child going down a slide with friction. What happens as the to the mechanical energy as he slides down. It's not conserved, but it comes less and less. But what happens to that lost energy? You don't actually lose it. It's just converted into what's called non-mechanical energy. Like um, between the legs or the pants in the slide, it gets warmer, so it's lost it to thermal energy. Maybe even some has converted into sound energy. Okay, here's a practice problem for you to try. What's the elastic potential energy, kinetic energy, the speed, and how high?
So now, if two students standing side by side at the top of the water slide and one steps off, what do you think, who would have the greater speed? They would probably be about the same. And when it's conserved, we mean we don't lose or gain. And some other examples would be um, conservation of mass that we would have that we learned in chemistry.